Yes, there we go. Okay. Um, the last thing that we talked about was this notion of an invertible ideal. And so using the notation from last time. Uh, and sometimes this is uh, uh, another notation for this is this is the convector from uh, I to R. Um, notice that I, I inverse by definition is contained in R. And if I, I inverse is actually equal to R, then uh, I is contained. Oh, by the way, for you all and all the people out there, um, I will not be in office hours today until 11 o'clock. I've got something I've got to do in the 10 to 11. So holler at me after class if I'm ruining your life by this. Uh, and we can make some uh, arrangements, but uh, I'll be back in my office by shortly after 11. Okay. Um, so this is what it meant to be an invertible ideal. And we did uh, a non example, right? We looked at the maximum ideal of polynomial renal with field with two variables that wasn't invertible. We noticed that every principal ideal is invertible. And then I gave you kind of a neat example in the ring C a joint with the square root of negative five that is invertible. So let me give you kind of a little, let me give you a short example to kind of justify something. So the invertible fractional ideals are all principal. Um, and there's a big mess up, right? So um, Oh, yeah. So if you look at, so I'm going to come back to the stuff in a moment. A and B are a set of ideals that are fractional and invertible. Um, so these are fractional and invertible ideals. Are. Notice that notice that A and B are is an abelian group. Um, and I gloss over this in the notes a little bit. So let me. Let me kind of make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so, the one, uh, so suppose that you have two invertible ideals here, then uh, IA equals R. As of JV. So that is to say, I can find an inverse, uh, I inverse, I call it A, and J inverse, I call it B, and IA is R, and JV is R, right? Notice that. Notice that IJ times AB is equal to R. And notice this is a, a notice that. Uh, AB is in fact the inverse IJ, right? Because uh, anything here times anything here because of this is in R, right? So that is to say, IJ inverse. And so, in particular, the collection of 
convertible ideals is closed under uh, multiplication of ideals, right? Um, now, let's see. If I remember, I need an identity element for a group. Anybody want to guess what the identity element is? N. I and D are the identity element. Yes. What ideal can you multiply by and it leaves everything alone? That's right. Multiply any of those invertible ideals by R and you get R. Because R times I is contained in I by the definition of a fractal ideal. And since R has a one in it, you can get the equality, right? Notice that multiplication of ideals like this is associative. This is something that you know goes back to 8510. So we've got that. And um, by definition, we have inverses, right? So we're good to go with it. I and the R is a group. Um, can anybody think of a subgroup of this? Okay. And don't say I and B are in R itself, right? So I'll take those off the table. Mm -hmm. What's a large class of ideals that we know is invertible, but we know in general is not exhaustive? How about the principal ideals? So consider this group. I can write this more simply. This is just omega r, or omega again, the quotient field for max zero. So this is just all the principal ideals, and principal ideals in the quotient field, right? So for example, if that was z, this would also have one half z and two thirds z, and all that kind of crap in there, right? Notice that every principal ideal is invertible, and this forms a subgroup. Now, uh, let me come back to this example I started with before I want to give you a little background. Notice that for the integer z, for example, you have a whole bunch of principal ideals. And in fact, in this particular case, because z is a principal ideal domain, all the invertible ideals, that's something else we showed last time, all the invertible ideals for principal ideal domain are automatically principal, right? So good for us. That means that the invertible ideals and principal ideals here are the same. Now, uh, lots of people would consider this group of invertible ideals of Z to be a big, huge mess, right? In fact, in a certain sense, this is isomorphic to the non-zero rational numbers under multiplication, right? I mean, it's... Uh, no, the non the, the positive rationals under multiplication. Uh, by the way, why did I make that distinction? What's the difference between? So I, at first I said, oh, you know, for the integers, uh, the the collection of invertible ideals, which looks like this, uh, should be the uh, non-zero. Uh, rationals under uh, under multiplication and then I, I I changed that and I said the positive rationals why is that that is correct if, if you look at like one half r and negative one half r that's the same idea right so this is really this is kind of too big and unwieldy and so this is kind of Motivation for the next one. Uh, let R be any domain. Okay. Uh,
uh, print R is a set of omega R, omega point K minus zero. So we have these two groups. And really what we want to do, and this is kind of a nifty thing, we define the class group. Be this quotient, right? Of course, uh, print R is a subgroup of I and VR. It's normal because everything's chameleon, and so you can do this this quotient. Or how many of you have ever encountered a class group in your travels? Right. Uh, I bet you two in a number theoretical set, right? This is a very popular thing to do in, in, in number theory, right? Um, and in fact, one of the one of the things that makes this so popular in algebraic number theory is it turns out, so this is kind of culture for now, if you will, if you have any ring of algebraic integers. So what do I mean when I say that? I mean the integral closure in Z of a finite extension of the rationals. Right, so something like z adjoint square root of negative five, or z adjoint of one plus square root of negative nineteen over two, or z adjoint with cube root of two, one of these things. It turns out that the the class group. It turns out that every ideal is invertible, uh, and this quotient here is the class group has very very nice properties. It's finite, right, in that particular case for those types of groups, it's finite. And number two. There are, in fact, infinitely many primes in every one of the finite ideal classes. In fact, in a certain sense, if you have five ideal classes, right? So if the class group was isomorphic to Z5, God very generously deals out the prime ideals sort of evenly throughout all the, all the ideal classes. Uh, neither of these facts is true in general for a more general domain. And that's why you get really nice, a lot of really nice factorization type results. Uh, when you're doing everything, but let me let me point out. So this is, the idea behind this is this kills a lot of noise, right? So for example, if R is a principal ideal domain, um, then uh, Uh, we proved this last time that every invertible ideal is back principle. Uh, so, so the class group is true, right? It's, it's only the ad one, right? And so, uh, one, one sometimes makes the argument that so a class, the class group basically, for certain types of domains anyway measures how far away R is from being a principal ideal domain, right? That's sort of the bigger the class group, the further away you are from having, you know, every invertible ideal being a principal. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Okay, let me give you a now a theorem about invertible. This is one of my favorite ones. And let me give you a word of caution with this theorem too. Um, so don't make a, a mistake with this. There are four, four, two, four. And I and uh, not necessarily not I and convertible ideal. Okay, let me make a couple of remarks before we start off. Uh, do you remember how I 
I wrote I as an R and then I embarrassingly erased that. I could have left that up. I wanted to make the statement more general, but why is it? So this makes a statement about all invertible algebras, right? Uh, that is, every single invertible idea was finally generated. I first started off with I contained an R, but really what I had originally is logically equivalent to this statement. Anybody come to the line? Uh, it's an R. It's just uh, well, or, or actually, because the fact is, prior to mine, there was a small part by C. Well, right? So even if I was, even if, if I is in, uh, if, if I is an arbitrary um, invertible ideal that is not contained in R, all you have to do is multiply by non zero A and it's in R, right? And so you can use that to show that I, I could have said I is an R, but I, I like the statement to be a little bit more general. Let, let me also point out very, very strongly that the converse to this theorem is not true by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, the first non-example that we gave last time, gave an example of a two-generated ideal, xy, maximal ideal, and uh, fxy, and it's certainly finite to generate that's not convertible. Okay, here's a quick... Uh, this is corollary. Uh, in fact, I love all observations about this. Uh, 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 cool. But all the in the domain such that every ideal. And I was in the theme of the last remark I made, I was uh, intentionally ambiguous on that because this ideal, it doesn't matter whether I I'll let this be any uh, fractional ideal or whether I'm strictly kind of meaning contained at all. Then R is. Every ideal is verbal, then R must be so I like these kind of observations. And when we get to data and domains, this will this will help us. Uh, by the way, so proof of 424. This is a this is absolutely a wonderful theorem, right? I mean, because when you look at it, the condition for I being invertible is there's some other crazy fractional ideal. It is not clear at all to me from just looking at that. Why in the world does that force I to be finite to generate? But it does. Any uh, any idea? Uh -huh. I I inverse to the R, there's going to be some A and I and B and I inverse. No, not A. There's going to be some elements such that you can get the identity. Okay, that is, that is the crucial observation. Uh, I I inverse equals R. And notice that this contains one. Right. So there exists a one, a two, and n and i, and let's say b one, b two, b you know, and i inverse such that a one b one plus a two b two, a you know, b n is equal to one. Okay, good enough. That's a key observation because even though um, 
you know that there is a finite linear combination of the AIs, uh, AIBIs that gives you one. Hmm. Now, how do we leverage that into a proof? I'm going to make a strong claim here. I claim I claim that I is type generated by those elements that happen to appear in that representation. And by the way, uh, even though I didn't say this in the theorem, this gives us an interesting observation that we could throw in, and that is I is generated minimally by whatever. So if this claim is true, then find a minimal n such that you can find a relationship with this is true, and that's how many generators you need, right? Or that's the minimum number of generators. So, how is this, right? How, how can we how can we do this? Well, That's certainly true, right? Because by assumption, each of those EIs is an A to I. So any other linear combination of those AIs has to be an I, right? That's the easy part. How about the other? Well, for the other component, what well, I can be an arbitrary element of I, right? Now, Let's revisit my equation here. And let's, I don't have a lot of faith in this color. Oh, that's all right. Uh, multiply both sides of this equation by alpha. And I'm going to write this gauge. So Now, uh, do you all, all see it? What's, what's the key observation I need to make to the point? That is correct because every one of these is actually in R. As alpha is an I and BI and I inverse. So the product alpha BI has to be an R by assumption. So alpha is in A1, A2, AN. So now we have an equality. Right? I think that's a really kind of slick theorem, right? And you see that it does depend on invertibility. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So, if you remember, I'm not going to go through the details of this example again, but last time we saw uh, the Gabriel 2, 1 plus make sana is invertible. Um, let me give you sort of a theorem in contrast, if you will. Uh, yeah, R is
parts to the quantity local. Uh, and I is in verb line, the old bar. Then, uh, uh, in my notes, at this point, I only have quasi-local, so I'm going to actually prove this for quasi-local. Um, quasi-local means, of course, there's only one maximum ideal. It's actually also true, this theorem is all, uh, also true if you only have finitely many. See if you can look at the proof and see how to generalize this. It's a little bit more sticky. Uh, for multiple ideals, but as long as you find it in many, you can do some avoidance and do this. Um, uh, yeah, R is single cross level. Again, C R. Uh, any verbal ideal has to be the principle. <laughs> and I write this down. You'll think I'm silly for writing this down, and it does seem a little silly, but it, it is kind of funny. Yes. Sometimes making connections to this can lose this proof, right? That is a non standard proof. You can get on your horse and go and argue that, uh, yes, any prime here, any ordinary prime in Z um, is a proper ideal when Z adjoins the square root of negative five, and they all remain co maximal. And you could go through all this, but the fact that you had a non principal and verbal ideal here shows that there has to be infinitely many maximal ideals, right? And I think that's kind of weird, right? Okay, any questions? So I'm gonna prove 426 for quasi-local. And like I said, I think this gives the idea of proceeding quasi-local. Well, I'll let you close all on that. Uh, suppose R is quasi local. And I in R is invertible. Now, of course, the first thing that you may claim here. Uh, or that you may get angry at me a little bit for is the fact that I'm assuming that I is an R. But again, if I is not an R, because this is invertible, it's fractional, and I can multiply by a principal ideal to get it back down into the range. So there's really no loss of generality. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, so for ease, we assume that R is uh, down in, inside of, I'm sorry, that I is down inside of R. Uh, we also know by previous. I is generated by A1, A2, AN. That comes in handy because it's um, it's invertible. It has to be finitely generated. Um, as before, we say I inverse is generated by B1, B2. Then that's kind of an interesting thing about verbal ideals is if I can be generated by n elements, then so can its inverse because the proof of the final degenerate thing is symmetric, right? So, and as before again, we will say that a1 d1 plus a2 d2 plus a and n is equal one. Um,
No. A R V I is an R. Correct. Because just by definition, uh, this is I inverse of product has to be an R. Uh, and in fact, let me go further than that. Let me say I, A, I, B, J. Yeah, doesn't matter. So that's your emphasis. So when you make some kind of R, it's called local. Same with maximum ideal. M, uh, at least one of these uh, elements is not an M. One of these has to not occupy M because if all of these occupy M, then you have one as an M, right? And so and again, leaning on the quasi-local business, what can I conclude about A1B1 if it's not the minus Y ideal? This this is this is kind of a quasi local because of the fact that there's only one maximum ideal. If you don't live in that maximum ideal, you're a unit, baby. So a one p one must be a unit. Well, that's that's where we use the quasi-local most effectively. Uh, now, for all for all case between there, then I think we can kind of agree with that. Um, and let's see what I want to do. I want to replace that by A1. Okay, there we go. So AK is U inverse A1B1 AK. Right? And let me do a little test digitation here. This is U inverse um, B one A K A one, right? And this thing is an R, and this is an R, so this is an I get a derivative A one. Therefore. Ah, uh, uh, well, um, else? each one of these is contained in A1, right? And on the other hand, we certainly have this contained there as well. So, and then we have right? um, the key here, of course, was the fact that I was able to uh, pigeonhole A1 into being a unit, right? Or, I'm sorry, A1B1 into being a unit. 
All right, and that was kind of the key. Notice that even with two maximal ideals, this becomes a little bit more problematic because you can have something out here and something out here, right? But if you're careful, what you can do is you can use the fact that there's only finite and many ideals to sort of force this condition to come out anyway. You can sort of force a, a, a unit to come out by doing something called prime avoidance. You might think about how to do it. Think about how to do it in the two case, and I think it might clarify things. Okay. Um, Okay, so once again, I'm going to step up from here. Oh, yes, I did skip a number, but there's a corollary that's very similar to what I did before. So uh, for this one, we're going to let I be a finitely generated ideal. Uh, Right, yeah, right. Okay, and I'm trying to remember that ideal. Uh, then I is verbal if and only if. I would have lost M the principal. All max ideals. So this is kind of a so the famous buzzword for this is. Invertibility is equivalent to being locally principal, right? Um, uh, and this is also true if and only if. And I'll, I'll explain in a moment why this is really just kind of superfluous, right? Um, let me uh, make a remark before we start. The hypothesis I is finitely generated. Right. So you might say, uh, oh, Jim, but can you remove that in the following sense? You say, if R is a domain. I is invertible if and only if I am the principal uh, for all in the max spec. Um, the answer is in one direction, it shouldn't be a problem, right? Because starting here, you don't need this hypothesis because you automatically get finitely generated if you assume invertible, right? So you should be getting good to go here. But here's $64,000 question Can anybody think of an ideal that is not? Finitely uh, generated, but when you localize it at say every maximal ideal, it's in fact principal. Hmm. Uh, 
I'll give you an example. Uh, actually, maybe I'll give you right now. I'm not gonna. I'm not. The details on this are are, are too maddening. Uh, but I, I'm gonna show you how this works. Uh, Let's say sumo. Let's bring up sumo. Uh, uh, let's say semi local. You can get out of the Yeah. You can find an extender with primes. E1, EK, E1, EN. You can find a quadratic extension where uh, actually, not so far, right? I have an extension where E1 of the EK remain prime. And Q1 or QI is Q1 and minus Q1. Well, uh, So this is actually, this is actually kind of a, a slash number theory to be in bound for. This is, this lemma is used, Gilmer uses it quite a bit, and it's used to construct in certain examples. So you can, if I have a semi local PID and you have a, a finite list of primes that are here, and they're all principal, I can build an extension, I think I can make a quadratic problem to check that for you, uh, where this list remains prime, so it's still prime up here, and this actually splits into two smaller primes in the extension. And this allows me to do following. So again, I'm not going through all the details here, but you can start at R1 level that has a single prime P, right? So this is a PID. This is a you know, theory evaluation domain, right? It's, it, it's evaluation domain instead of unique prime. I'm going to go to an extension where this splits like this. So now I've got two primes, right? I'm going to split it again. And whenever I split it, what I've done is I've split this prime, and this one, I've let, I've, I've let this one remain prime. All right? So at this level, at R3, this guy is split into two primes, so now I've got three primes here. At the next level, I'm going to split the prime again. And now the primes here are these. Let's see what I'm doing. And at the next level again, I'm going to leave these three primes prime. I'm going to split this one. Then I'm going to leave these four primes, split this one, and so forth. So now, if you take the union of this, let R be this is something called an almost dead end uh, and we're going to talk about that later. But let me let me kind of show you effectively what happened. Right? This has um, yeah, in fact, this is a called sequence domain. I think this has infinitely many maximal ideals. There's one of them. There's another one. There's another one. These are all primes, and they actually, this is a, they generate maximal ideals here. All these primes are finally generated, and then there's this one. The one that goes up that stalk is not finally generated, right? Because if it was, 
it would have to be generated by finitely many elements in the stock. But at the next step, I destroy. I, so, for example, if these are the four generators, at the next step, this is no longer be, going to be a generator because it won't generate uh, the two that have been split off of it. Right? So, this has countably many principal maximum ideals. They're good to go. And then you've got this one nasty one here that is uh, maximal. Right. Everybody agrees that the big stock is not finitely generated, right? Because every one of these things divides the success as ones, it can't be finitely generated. Right? We'll call this one M. Would everybody agree that if you take uh, the ideal M and you localize at any of these, it's in fact principal, right? By agree with them? Because in fact, when you localize at any of these maximal ideals, M becomes the whole ring, right? Because these two things are co-maximal, right? Everybody okay with that? And if you look at our localized M, this is a PIG. Do you guys see why that's true? It might be a little hard to figure out. And in fact, in our localized M, M our localized M actually only has the maximal ideal M as its maximal ideal. It's actually generated by the smallest element. In fact, it's generated by any element. Because what happens when you localize here is you're turning all the crap that's not into it into units, right? So in our localized M, in our localized M, this string of ones out here are all units, right? So really, this factorization X is this times this. This is a unit, so X and this are associates, right? And now, this split off here, this is a unit, so uh, this and this are associates because, um, right, so... This is this time this, this is the unit. So these two are associated. So all these of the stock in that localization are now turned into the same element of two units, right? So that is an example of an ideal, this one right here, that is not finitely generated, right? However, when you localize at that, it's principal. So in particular, this maximal ideal, when you localize at every maximal ideal, will be principal. If you localize at any of these, it will be the unit ideal. And if you localize it here, it will just be generated by the principle. So at the end of the day, this is going to be a player. And then, of course, it's only going to be a player in this direction. So you might think about why the equivalence of this and this, and we'll get to the proof next time. Any questions on that? Everybody understand that weird construction? I like the weirdness. <laughs> All right. Any questions out there? All right, well, you all, um, oh, by the way, I'm giving the math club talk today. It's that unit analysis thing where we're going to break some government secret, secret. So it's going to be there great. Otherwise, have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday. <laughs>